Uh, my guest today is Dr. Peter Borosian. We happen to have the same last name. My mother's last name is also Borosian. This is a very interesting person we're going to be talking to today. He decides to troll academia by writing some hoax papers, which maybe we'll get into. Also wrote a couple books. The book we'll talk about today is called How to Have Impossible Conversations, a very practical guide, necessary skill to be able to learn how to do it today. And September 2021, he resigned from his position at Portland State University, citing harassment and a lack of intellectual freedom. Dr. Peter Borosian, it's great to have you on. Thank you, and I'm, I'm loving the fact that you pronounced my last name correctly. I listened to a couple of the interviews. They said um, uh, uh, Bogosian, uh, Bogosian. It's, right. it's, yeah, but the ga, ga, ga is, a, ga is an Armenian pronunciation and it's a little tough yeah. to do. Yeah, I tell everybody it rhymes with explosion just to make it easy. Explosion, Bogosian. There you go. There you go. So, uh, Peter, I mean, listen, you're, you're one entertaining, you're witty, you're uh, one of those. Uh, 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 a genius scientist types that knows how to play the games to, uh, you know, mess with the other guy. But before we get into the book and before we get into some of the things that's going on, maybe maybe why don't we talk about why you recently resigned from your job at Portland State University? Yeah, I was going to say keep expectations low for the interview. Um, <clears throat> I resigned from my position at Portland State University because I was hired to teach critical thinking and ethics and the university became so woke and so utterly preoccupied with issues of gender and race and sexual orientation that it was not only was it infused in everything, but unless you towed the party line, there were consequences to that. And so I just I couldn't maintain my integrity and, and teach there anymore. And what does that mean? What is towed party line? What, what does that mean in your world? In my world, it means that there are certain conclusions that you have to have about, and by the way, I actually share those conclusions, but certain conclusions that people have to have about, you know, trans bathrooms, or I should say I share many of those conclusions, not all of them, or, or uh, Donald Trump, or whatever the orthodoxy is. They have a moral orthodoxy of things that, that, that they believe, diver diversity, equity, inclusion, microaggressions i mean it's a it's all bundled up together and the university became and is uh, uh, an indoctrination center and i don't think kids go there and they get any kind of an education that you and i would be familiar with they go in there and and they're expected to i think the the wording i used was mimic the moral certainty of ideologues so these people are ideologues they have moral beliefs that they come into the classroom with and not only do they teach those, but they test those those kids on the beliefs and they want it back. So it's really a, a, a terrible situation, even if you agree with it. So look, th think about it like this. I think that part of the problem is that people get too caught up into right thinking and left thinking. And, oh, you know, a academia is 90. Actually, Portland State University, the National Scholars Association, found that 99 percent of the faculty and administrators donated to one political party. Get out of here. Yeah, it's true. 99%? Yeah, you can look it up. The National Association of Scholars, and then there's the Oregon Association of Scholars. You, you know what that party is, right? Of course, they're all Trump guys. They're all MAGA guys, right? I'm, I'm a, the... <laughs> yeah, so, so, the, so I, I don't necessarily think that's a problem, but because you, you know people can believe anything they want, but remember, this is a public institution, yeah. right? So this is a public institution. Kids are going there. They're never hearing from people who believe other sides of the argument. And, and it's the whole thing is just so disheartening. So for somebody that's not in that world, maybe give us a visual of what that world looks like, both for students who are going there with maybe opposing ideas, as well as a professor that's in that world where 99 percent gives to one party. And you're just kind of trying to. And by the way, uh, for, for the audience to know this, you were not supportive of anyone in 2016 on the right as candidates, right? I don't, I don't think you were even so. So it's not like you're one that's a MAGA team or anything like that. You're just a professor that's trying to teach there. But maybe, yeah. give, us, maybe give us a visual of what it's like to be in that world today. 
Sure, but not just 2016. I've never voted for a Republican in my life. So I'm not. That's like very important for the audience to know. That's very important for the audience to know that. Yeah, I'm not some. Not even am I not a right wing maniac. I'm not even a right wing guy. Period. And so you know, I I believe I'm an atheist as well, uh, and I I want to talk about that in, in the context of your question. So what does it look like? It looks like kids go into the classroom and they never hear the other side of the argument. They never hear an opposing view, and they certainly, if they do, which I doubt, but they never hear it from someone who believes it. Why is that a bad thing? Well, 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 well if, if you don't hear an opposing view, it's an indoctrination mill. You're, you're going there to parrot back or regurgitate. You're not teaching people how to think and then making decisions on their own. Let me, let me give you an example. So I teach, a, I taught a class, it feels freeing to say that. I taught a class in atheism, and I'm a, I'm a very out and very outspoken atheist, and I would have people come into my class. So I would tell people exactly what I believe, and then I would have believing Christians who were qualified come into my class and speak to the kids. And I'll give you an example. Somebody wrote after wow. my resignation letter. Somebody wrote, Dr. Phil Smith wrote a letter to the Oregonian. He's a conservative Christian. He teaches at a conservative Christian university here in Portland, Oregon. And I gave him uh, the whole class, provided that he had a Q&A. So he couldn't just give a lecture. So he gave a one-hour lecture and answered a one-hour Q&A about his best arguments for the existence of God. I didn't say a thing. And I let the kids decide. So the students themselves make their decisions. And I viewed my job is to, not only to be honest with them, but to bring in the best representatives of the other side. And so he wrote, and I had no idea he was going to do that. He wrote a lovely op-ed to the Oregonian, which is the local paper here. And so what does it look like? It looks like only one view is forwarded. It looks like you can't question certain things that are morally fashionable, like equity. And most people, by the way, they don't even have the slightest clue what equity means or diversity or inclusion or any of these things that have been that have hijacked. Uh, I mean, these things are now infused in our institutions and most people have no idea what they mean. So so, you know, let's start off with the basic part. Woke. You, you hear woke every, everywhere. I mean, obviously, you and I know what woke means, but how would you define what woke means? All right, it's funny you ask that. I have a video series coming out that translates wokeish into plain language. And it's a there's 60 second videos. Basically woke means to be awakened to the injustice in the world. And the more woke you are, the more you understand that you can never be woke enough because reality is just infused with injustice and oppression everywhere. And so the part of the communication problem and that's my book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, is that people are speaking past each other, particularly in this context, woke people are using certain words that they, they don't traffic in the normal meanings of words when we look them up in the dictionary like e equity would be another a, a, a perfect word that's totally misunderstood I, my kids go to public school here in oregon or my 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 daughter my, my son graduated every email equity 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 do you know what equity means you're asking ask somebody, me ask somebody in your in, in your film crew over there the David, what does equity mean? Today. Well, he, he, this is the seventh time, but <laughs> what does equity mean, David? Uh, to have a piece of something, yeah? Like to... No, no, not equity of a company. Equity as an equity uh, 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 in, in, uh, in, in society. Equity. Oh, I, would, I mean, that's, I don't know. You wouldn't uh, know. Equity in society to be. Well, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, it's not okay. equity like you so own a piece of the great. company. <clears throat> All right, so this is wonderful. This illustrates the point. The vast majority of people have no idea what the word equity means. And, you know, the guy that you're going to fire after this episode, yeah. he's, he's, absolutely, he's, absolutely, <laughs> he's absolutely correct. They've changed the meanings of the word. So equity means to make up for, this is Ibram Kendi's definition uh, or, or part of his worldview that feeds into the definition. To make up for past injustices, we need to future injustices and future and present injustices. So if people have been just systematically discriminated against because they're, you know, gay or trans or black, we need to um, fix that by discriminating against people who don't have those characteristics. The other thing to think about with equity is you want equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. That's why the governor of New York, for example, has uh, are, are AP classes. Yeah, yeah, well, they're they're getting rid of the talented and gifted yep. 
programs for kids because the idea is it's an equity-based system. It's not. It's the opposite of equality. But the only re reason I mention this at all is because one of the reasons that woke has made such inroads is that in in you know when you ask David, most people don't know what these words mean, and so we're basing policies, educational policies for our kids in K through 12 systems, for our judiciary, for our media. We're basing these for the ACLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center. All of these things are now a value that suddenly sprung into existence that nobody heard of five years ago. And if they did, it was in the context of finance. Now, who's driving you this, know? though? Who's, who's driving these initiatives? Who's the mastermind behind this today? Because okay, it exactly. seems like it's sudden that this happened in the last five, ten years. Yeah, that's, that's correct. It started in the university system and it leaked out of the university system. I, I want to say two things. You, you remember how shocked you were at the 99% of people? Very much so, there? yes. Okay, so, so I think the problem is that people get way too caught up in, oh, this is a right-left thing or conservatives or Republicans. Forget about that. Forget about that. Let's say, let's say that, that, that the people in there were Mormons. Let's say that 99% of the people at a university were Mormons. Do you think that, that and, and it was a liberal arts university, yeah, as opposed to, you know, STEM or you mm -hmm. know, civil engineering or math or something, do you think that those kids would get an, as good of an education from that as they would if there were intellectual diversity where there are some Mormons and some Muslims and some atheists and some Christians? Of course, you're going to have more, uh, you know, if you have diversity, if you have a, a, right. a sure. And so part of the, that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is that you're correct. Intellectual diversity benefits our kids. It benefits our democracy. It benefits our society. But when you hear the word diversity, which is a very, very common word now, it, it, what they mean is two things. They mean intellectual homogeneity. They mean an environment in which everybody thinks the same and has a certain set of beliefs, but has superficial characteristics. Yeah, but, but I, I guess what I want to know is, do you know who drove these things? Like, who is driving these initiatives? Like, yes, and, 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 very, then, and then next, what's the master plan? Because you're not going to be able to push this for too far. There's going to be pushback by people on the opposing side that they're just not going to take it eventually. So yeah, okay. who's driving this and why? Okay, so that's a, sec a separate question. So we've identified the problem. We've seen how it... The, we, we, here's what happens. So kids go into the university system. Yeah. They're taught by people who believe this. And these people are true believers. Okay. Not all of them. Because they've created a culture of fear. So anybody who speaks up against it is a bigot, is a homophobe, yep. is a racist, yep. is a misogynist, is a Nazi in some cases. And so so they've, they have jobs for life. It's called tenure. They teach people, you know, basically what are moral conclusions. They test them on it. Three, four, five, six years later, these kids get out. They go to they get out of the university. They go into the workforce. Because they have degrees then, they occupy positions of administration, management, et cetera, and they bring these ideas with them. The pronoun ideas, the safe spaces, the trigger warnings, the microaggressions. The nucleation point where this all starts is the university system, all of it. I get that, but wh so why? What do you, so let's just say, uh, let's just say, for example, uh, 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 the first Titanic that was shot, the director was a guy that was a Nazi, and the producer was Hitler, and the hero in the first Titanic was a Nazi, right? And by the way, that's a true story. So when that first Titanic that came out, the messaging for Hitler was to get people to say, what a great hero Nazi is, what a great community they are, they're good people. And then our guard comes down, and we're more, you know, recept we're more willing to receive information or influence from those guys. Who's behind this and what's the outcome to do what? Like, okay. I understand so, if a person is saying, I want to get everybody to eliminate this. So I become the person they listen to because one day we're going to do X, Y, Z. What's the motive? OK, so the motive is the idea. And you see this in this is the other thing we should probably talk about. Colleges of education. Um, bracket that. We'll come back to that. later. Okay. The motive is that there is oppression everywhere. <clears throat> there is systematic oppression. And the evidence for this, they don't really use evidence or really talk about evidence, but a way for sane, rational people to think about it is, well, why would they believe this? Well, they believe this for a few reasons. First, they are 100% correct in that 
that there has been systemic racism up until f fairly recently it has been embedded in systems african americans have been treated horrifically and you know even uh uh you know, there were miscegenation laws in this country where people couldn't marry other people, and they were specifically set up for black men and white women. And those those have gone away in, in, in even in my lifetime, and I'm 55. So the, the main driver for this is the historical truth that there were uh, real, genuine systemic oppressions, and that those oppressions still exist. And because they still exist, we need to overthrow the institutions that allow the perpetuation of systemic injustice. That's why the university is constantly talking about systemic injustice. And that's also, by the way, I don't know if you want to get down this rabbit hole, why they look at the police, they want to defund the police. Because the police are the things that are standing in the way of the current society that we have. They're upholding the institutions and the structures that we have. And if you can defund the police, then you can um, weaken those institutions by allowing people to revolt and... I totally get all of that. Everything you said, I totally get. I, I'm aware of everything okay. you just said right now. What I'm asking is, yeah. who's the leader for this and what's the outcome? To do what? To bring well, down e e America? Okay. Is it to, you know, eliminate uh, westernized thinking? Is it to eliminate capitalism? Yes. Is it to... what? Who is the voice? Who's the person behind okay. it? And what's the outcome? Okay, there is no singular voice. Okay. So you can think about this like being, uh, in, a, in a weird way, like being a Protestant as opposed to being a Catholic. There is no pope of this stuff. Now, there, there may be bishops or there may be very influential voices behind this, but there is no leader that's govern, governing things. The outcome is... So even the fact that you ask what the outcome is means you've thought about it more than people who have lived in this space. The, one of the outcomes is you see these, these zones popping up, like these chazes popping up in Seattle and Portland. I, I really don't think that they've seen, they've thought through what the outcome is when you overthrow Western values and Western civilization and freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a big one that you have to overthrow. Freedom of assembly, due process. And again, they're looking at the United States as fundamentally racist and oppressive, and they want to overthrow it. Now, when you ask me what the outcome is, I can I can give you my own opinion of okay. what the outcome Please. is. Please, you'll you'll see a new world hegemon. The United States is an empire in decline. That's completely obvious right now, especially after that, which I don't want to talk about. But but, but the uh, the fiasco, the utter catastrophe that was Afghanistan. Uh, our, our alliances are weakening. Our economy is struggling. If you look at the, the trade between uh, other, other countries in the United States in the last 20 years, it's shifted primarily to China. So if they think the United States is a bad boogeyman, and you should look into the one belt, one road policy in China, wait until they see the new, the new hedge mod. They're really not going to like that. Who, who's, who's the, uh, who wants to see this happen to America? Who wants to? Because, you know, a lot of times when you think about this stuff, you, you think about proxy wars, you think about how some of these countries are sitting there saying, listen, the way I'm going to get to America is by pinning X, Y, Z against them. So they're playing those games. But who would like to see America's way of living, capitalism, all of that fall? Who would love to see that happen? You're, you're a good interviewer. Really, these are great questions. Uh, my friend Faisal Amutar, who uh, heads Ideas Beyond on Borders, he's an Iraqi refugee who's come to this country. He's an amazing human being. Um, he was telling me, was spending time with him was like dog years. It's like seven to one. Um, he was telling me that, the, the, that many places in the Middle East, primarily funded by China and Russia, are, have uh, stations dedicated to BLM, dedicated to the divisive madness that's currently overtaking. So basically, the enemies of the United States want to see this succeed. They want to see these rebellions succeed. Meanwhile, there are people who are, there are countries who are literally putting their own citizens in concentration camps, and you don't hear a peep about it from these folks. When, you know, you'll hear about a gender imbalance at a conference, but when ISIS takes literal slaves, and we know that we have the videos from the, the slave bazaars when they take Yazidi women, uh, there's not a peep, there's not a protest, there's, there's nothing. You don't, you don't hear anything about it. So to answer your question directly, there are countries like Russia and China and Iran, to a certain extent, who are directly funding the BLM and, and the, the accoutrements are the kind of the um, conceptual drivers for this. And then you have the people on the far left, the woke far left in particular, 
um, who really want to see the end to what they consider to be an oppressive patriarchal regime. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens here. By the way, going back to your book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. So when you're dealing in an environment, in a climate where 99 percent is given to one party and one percent is given to the opposing party, how do you have those difficult, those impossible conversations with people from uh, uh, the opposite aisle? I mean, how do you have those conversations? Yeah, that, that's a, another really good question. It's actually really easy to have those questions. That once somebody, when I taught in prisons, I, I did my dissertation and I taught prison inmates how to think through moral questions. And I pulled from the history of Western philosophy, you know, questions like what does it mean to be, what is justice? And she's so many questions, you know, can you be unjust towards yourself? And what does it mean to be a good man? When people will talk to you, Already, even even if you think the, the the gulf or the divide is so great, the moment someone's talking to you, the, that's that's great. Um, the, those conversations are more far more possible than you think. Far more possible. The problem is when they won't talk to you, and that's the situation which we have now. These the folks who participate in this ideology, they don't. Um, buy into the norms of civil society. They don't buy into reason, discourse, evidence. And this is really important for your audience to understand. So if, if, if let's say that you and I want to figure out a problem. Let's say we want to figure out, you know, we've heard from Armenians, for example, and, and Armenians are claiming that uh, they're pulled over by the police at radically disproportionate rates than non-Armenians. You and I would sit down and would say, all right, man, we, we got to figure this out. How are we going to do this? And we'd say, okay, well, we're going to look at the, the, the body cams of people. We're going to, every time someone calls in, we're going to see if they have an IAN or the YAN, which anybody doesn't know, that's yep. the Armenian last name. Yep. And we're going to, and then we're going to, we're going to kind of study this somehow. We're going to figure out, you know, we're going to do a, a survey data, whatever, however we're going to do it. Okay. That's how sane, rational people go about figuring stuff out. These folks don't buy the traditional tools that we would use to solve problems. Reason, evidence, uh, epistemic adequacy, which basically means you know, knowing what you're talking about. Uh, what they would do is, so they believe, this is this uh, Aubrey Lloyd's, the master's tools cannot disable the master's house. The master's house is the current system we have and it's patriarchy, racism, oppression. So what built the, this is their thinking, like what built the system? Well, evidence, reason, you know, science to a certain extent, all of these things. So you can't disable the patriarchy. You can't disassemble it through evidence and reason. You have to use something else. Like you have to, you know, rip down statues. You have to tear stuff down. You have to Whatever, whatever the, the the particular brand of, of lunacy is, you have to defund the police. Um, you, you have to you have to make it so that the system in place is dis, is disabled. Was that clear? You have to do it so the system in place is disabled. Yes. Uh, I, I, I again, I fully get that. Uh, for me, it it uh, keeps going back to the outcome of what you're trying to do. Like, you know, if you look at different empires on how they fell, okay, Iran, Khomeini from the outside was sending tapes in, okay? Those tapes eventually caught, you know, they, they started creating some momentum. People were, you know, dubbing the tapes, passing it down to other people, and the messaging was, the Shah is too rich. Look at the celebration he put at the 2,500 years. That's your money. If I was running Iran, I would give that back to you. This is not fair. Look how bad the conditions are. Let's revolt. It's worth it. We can take them out. You know, look what Savak is doing to innocent people, et cetera, et cetera. Boom. They take them out. The outcome was get rid of Shah because they painted Shah to be the puppet to the right. West. And, you know, you know nothing's really going to happen. Okay. Forty some years right. later, it's still here. So that's one I'm trying to I'm trying to get a little bit so deeper me, to see what me, you have let there. Me, let me see if I can. Again, this is complicated. Let me see if I can give it to you. The, the goal what they want is a utopia. Now, they, they want, so, so this is, okay, so this is, this is the next level of this. So I'm going to try to explain it. <clears throat> it's very complicated. If it's unclear, you tell me. It's not, it's my explanation, not your understanding. 
part of the assumption going into this whole thing is that they have certain assumptions. They don't like what they call grand narratives. Grand narratives are sweeping explanations to explain things like Christianity is a grand narrative. Biology is a grand narrative. C communism is even a grand narrative. And so <clears throat> at root of this is a biology denialism. That's why you see so many of these folks deny evolution, for example. So when you, if, if you're trying to, okay, this is so complicated. Okay, every, this is the way they think. Every disparity of outcome is, the system is responsible for that. And the system is responsible for that because it's inherently racist. That's again, why they wanna get rid of the talented and gifted program. So every disparity in outcome is due to a racist system. So it couldn't possibly be to any cultural upbringing, or maybe it is, but it's certainly not due to biology. So if you can change the systems, you can engineer an outcome. You can engineer the outcome that you wanna engineer, which in, in one word to answer your question is utopia, but you can't get to the utopia if you have the existing systems. And part of the, and, and part of the reason for that is because they're biology denialists. They deny basic rudiments of biology. Unpack that. So, Unpack okay. that. So, um, <clears throat> okay, now I'm gonna get in trouble. This is where I get in trouble. Um, <laughs> so there are certain things that we can't talk about in society. Let me throw out, let me throw out something. What, what, if the, what is one of the commonalities among Nobel Prize laureates? Um, who have a disproportionate number of winners been? Left and academia. Uh, no, they've been- Scientists? Oh, I, I see what you're going, okay. Jews. They've been Jews. Okay. But not only have they been Jews, I was just talking to Brian Keating about this. Um, he's the guy who, uh, he's uh, the physicist into the impossible. Um, it's much easier to talk about this with people who actually share those identity markers than those who don't like you and you and I have a lot of identities in common, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just Jews. It's, it's not Sephardic Jews. It's Ashkenazi Jews. And it's not even just Ashkenazi Jews. It's Ashkenazi Jews that are from specific regions in like Poland, then Germany, the Breslau region. So why would that be? And how do we know that? Well, um, <clears throat> this is complicated. Steven Pinker, the psychologist from Harvard writes about this. One of the ways we learn about this is we look at identical twins separated at birth. And then again, this is a whole, I don't know, this is the whole thing is complicated. So the mean IQ is, is 100. The average IQ is 100. If you look at identical twins separated from birth, okay. so if you just pluck two people out of the population, the difference in IQ would be eight. But identical twins separated by birth would have a difference in IQ of four. That tells you that there's something biological to the IQ. But if your starting assumption is that there are nothing it, that biology doesn't determine cognition, it doesn't determine IQ, et cetera, et cetera, then you have to come up with a reason for that. And one reason you could say is, well, uh, that's racist, or the tests are faulty, or the tests don't test what you think they test, or w w whatever reason that you wanted to, mm -hmm. to come up with. By the way, parenthetically, this is extraordinarily interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens is, that idea itself is morally fashionable because people teaching it are basically on the woke left and they have been for years. And so what, what happens as a consequence of that is that we now have a generation of people who don't think that the IQ measures what psychologists say G or general intelligence, that it do doesn't measure what people think that it measures, right? It does, maybe it doesn't measure anything at all. So we have all these people now thinking the IQ is bogus. Can, can I tell you a cool story? Go for it. I don't think I've ever told anybody this before. So um, my mentor told me this story. This is absolutely fascinating to me. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my mentor, um, his name was Frank Wesley. He was interned in, in Buchenwald, 
he was picked up by Christ, uh, by the Nazis on on Kristallnacht, and he he became a, a psychology uh, professor. Fascinating man, fascinating history. He told me, and he was a behaviorist, um, and a behaviorist is someone who believes that you can control behavior by looking at it in terms of stimulus and response. Oversimplified, but basically. So he told me this unbelievable story. So there was a kid, and I think if memory serves me correctly, this kid was in Washington, and he kept punching his face like this. And they tried everything, but they couldn't get this kid to stop punching his face. And so what they did was they put electrodes on his arms, and when he brought his hand up there, they they zapped him. It only took two zaps on um two, two zaps for this kid to stop punching himself in the head now frank had this on um on on vcr i don't know if any of your you were maybe older than older than you but a vcr is like these analog tapes then they're, they're not digital mm -hmm. and so i don't know maybe you should i don't do you, will people even know what they'll know what vcr is, is. yeah oh, okay okay so so um so the, the, the tape had a, a glitch in it. So he sent the tape down to the AV or whatever IT yep. places yep. that fixed it. And the, I, the, the place reported the tape for having content which um, displayed human cruelty. It basically violated a rule. And so they literally cut the piece of the tape out. So you don't see the, the guy uh, punching him, but you can see the electrodes. And they also cut out the section that even explained that. So we, so that knowledge is then lost to the rest of humanity because it's viewed as cruel. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not you think it should be lost, that's we, that's another story yeah. entirely. Yeah. But, but the idea is that you can see how our institutions, based upon values that people have, determine the outcome of what people think is true. There was just something that came out recently about dog training. I can't remember the name of it, but you can put it on your screen. That that you know, uh, th there shouldn't be any punishment. A big of a dog. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, plus said you you know, there's dog training shouldn't have any punishment at all. It should be all reward. Okay, so that's ideological. That's not evidence based. So what happens now is. The, the people, for example, in the behaviorist with the kid punching himself yep. in the head or woke ideology or microaggressions or any of this stuff, all of that is then fabricated. It's it's it serves it lives in service to an ideology and not in service to the truth. And then people take this information and they they believe it because they think it's true. And then they get out and they. They bring it to the workplace. They talk about it to their friends. So the whole society is harboring some delusions about things. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So let me ask you, does this become the story that you told? Is that selective? That's not selective hearing. Is it selective teaching? Is it selective influence? Is it controlling a, a part of the information to help you come up with a different conclusion? And how often is that done You know, in academ academia? Well, it's it's done. The, the reason it's done is because people's moral minds override their rational minds. Now, the, the, look, I'm not saying that. I mean, there it, it's there's a reasonable conversation to be had, and I'm not really sure which side I fall on. You know, about Dr. Mengele's experiments on Jews, and should those you know when he broke bones over and over again, should we look at that uh, and use that to benefit humanity? Or is it? It was just so utterly monstrous; it shouldn't even be considered. I, I, we can have that conversation, but the point is that we're tr we're all doing our best to try to create systems here that are fair and just. And it, although they're not trying to create systems that are fair, they're trying to create systems that are equitable. But we're trying to do the right thing, and when you try to do the right thing. Often you're, you're you're living in service to an ideology. Your moral mind is truth is no longer your north star, right? So so the, the purpose of the institution hasn't become defined what's true. It's to replicate the dominant moral orthodoxy. Does this strategy work to work today? Meaning, like the direction they're going with wokeism, with equity, with gaslighting, with confusing the hell out of all of us and pinning us against each other, 
Is this a proven strategy long term? Because, you know, you're seeing some what you're starting to see as well is how people on opposite sides are sitting there saying, Listen, I disagree with my party, what they're doing. here. I also disagree with my party. Maybe we got more things in common than before. I'm not sure this approach, maybe it worked 200 years ago, maybe it worked 100 years ago. Do you think an approach like this is going to work today in America? Well, it's, it's, I'm shocked by the question. It's already worked. It's astonishing. Long term. You think long term this no, is sustainable? Term. Yeah, long term. No. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, it, 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 it is utterly it is utterly impossible to sustain itself long term. You would need a kind of tyranny. You know, you would need to upend, totally upend free speech. But it's interesting if you look at surveys, for example, from the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Yeah. It's great. Gainoff's organization, one in four college students believe that violence is acceptable to college lecturers. The, the, that's an astonishing, to guest lecturers who come in, it's an astonishing number of people who don't feel, think 40% don't feel they can ask questions or uh, ask difficult questions if it's on a moral topic. I mean, it's across the board, we're seeing people, we're seeing this, this effect incredibly successful in the short term, but not successful in the long I, I term. I don't think so, because if you think about what happened in, in, in Canada, Toronto, when the University of Toronto, I think it was when they came out with the trans, here's what we're going to be doing in the controversy with Jordan Peterson. Right. Let's take that out. Let's say that event doesn't take place. Do you think Jordan Peterson is as famous as he is today? Think about it. No. Take that no. event out. Who is Jordan Peterson? So, so I think what they're also doing is they're giving birth to Jordan Peterson, to Gatsaw, to, you know, people like yourself, to the Rogans of the world. They're, they're getting others to say, to a Russell Brand of the world, a Bill Maher of the world, to some people that maybe they would have never given birth to. They're like, wait a minute, this shit just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm backing off because I no longer agree with you because we're not on the same page. So I just don't think long term this approach of bullying is sustainable because to, what, what is the power of a free thinker? If you think about a free thinker, what, what's their DNA? They question things, they're curious, and they typically don't stop at no. They don't stop at mind your own business. So they don't do well with bullies. They typically stand up to bullies, and eventually bullies can bully the regular guys. They're like, oh, okay, I don't want to have any conflict. But until you face a free thinker, like, okay, I don't like messing with this guy. He's different. So you're going to give a lot of birth to free thinkers like Jordan Peterson over the next decade. Because I just don't think a lot of the free thinkers are going to stand alone, stand, stand there and just say, you know, we're going to take all the bullying from you. I see no, that not taking place. That's right. no, 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 that's right. And Jordan has done an amazing job of that. My, my friend Gad has done an amazing job of that. Uh, so the, the question is, how do we empower other people to stand up and fight back against this ideology? That's one, one question. It, not only is this not sustainable, listen, nobody likes living like this. Nobody likes being petrified of what they can say. Yeah. But people have been canceled because they were bullies in grade school. Are you freaking kidding me? They were bullies when they were six, and now that you're, you're denying them employment or you're complaining to their advertisers yeah. that they're you know white supremacists, which doesn't even have anything to do with it. And so not only do people not like living like this, but the question is, what damage is this going to do to our institutions in the short term. I mean, it's already done a tremendous amount of damage. By the way, you, you were talking about Nobel Prize earlier, so I went and looked up when you were talking uh, to see who's won over the years. Uh, yeah. Armenian, uh, uh, Bengali, four people. Armenian, one, apparently. Chinese, 12 people. Hokkien, one. Jewish, I'll get to Jewish last. Pashtun, Nobel is one. Punjabi is two. Tamil is three. Tibetan is one. And how many you think is Jewish, based on what you said? What do you think the number is? Well, the Jew Jews aren't even 2% of the population. So uh, significantly, significantly... 198 people of Nobel Prize laureates by ethnicity. 198. I mean, the numbers are staggering. And another article just came out yesterday that uh, by uh, the head, Goran Hansen, head of Royal Swedish Academy of Science Sciences, said yeah. they want people to win because they made the most important discovery. We will not have gender or ethnicity quotas, says top scientists. Interesting. Good for them. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that's a merit-based system. And again, I, so, so the question is, two questions. One, drill down the data, and you'll find that they're overwhelmingly Ashkenazi Jews. 
and they're overwhelmingly from certain region region of the planet. But the, the question is, well, why is that the case? That gets us a little far afield in our in our topic. But I brought that up because um, you you can't say that it's if you're on the woke left, you can't say that biology has anything to do with it. And it's interesting. So since we're having this conversation, let's just let's have this conversation. Let's be honest about this. So somebody was teaching. I'm not going to name the name of the institution. You can probably guess what it is. But somebody was teaching a philosophy of race class at that institution, and. Um, it was fascinating to me. I remember I, I, I was sitting across from this person and um, I just wanted to say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Like, and this is way outside my area. But I didn't do that because if I did that, I would have been accused of racism or bias. That's not saying I believe that they're valid biological races or that's not saying anything. It's just saying that there's a kind of there's even something called the bias response team that you can report people to if you think that they they have any bias in them whatsoever. And uh, many, I think, over uh, well over 200 institutions, academic institutions, have bias response teams. But it would seem to me like, you know, well, well, why do certain people get Tay-Sachs and other people don't? Why do certain people get sickle cell and other people don't? But you would think that the, the purpose of that class would be to to really take a look at what race is, what it means, et cetera, how it's come to be as an idea. But one would also think to be really honest about that, you'd have to at least talk a little bit about, uh, you know, race realism, or I'm even hesitant to talk about these things, but you would think that the, that you would have to give students um, the best voices from all sides of the, of the issue. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then don't offer the class. Right? Don't offer the class. But the other thing that's interesting about that is you would think that the qualifications for that person, they should have some biological qualifications. Master's degree in biology, PhD in philosophy. I don't know what it would be, but it would seem like that that's important. I'm gonna tell you, may, may I tell you one, one more quick story? Go for it, yeah. So I was at a, at a, um, at a, uh, a talk, and I'm not gonna name the university, the university where I used to teach, and somebody said that he wanted to, um, to, to offer a Native American uh, class, a class in Na Native American philosophy. Somebody in the audience said, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really, I think this is a wonderful idea. I love your presentation, but I'm not really comfortable questioning the, as, a, as a colonizer. I'm not really comfortable asking questions about things I disagree with in the philosophy. And and the presenter said, yeah, you know, I'm I agree. I'm not, not comfortable either. And the purpose would just be to teach the ideas and to sit with them and, and to learn, learn from them. Listen, the tool of the trade from Socrates on is counterexample, is question, is challenge. There is no nobody gets a free pass. If you want to put Native American philosophy in, into the philosophy department, great. I think that's the best idea, the wonderful idea. And we, do, we, we don't give it special treatment. We give it the same treatment that we give the French, the Germans, the Africans. Everybody gets the same treatment. We can generate counterexamples. We can find flaws or what we think are problems in the argument, and we move on. But the... But, but here's the other problem. Am I really going to be the guy who says, you know what, since we're not going to do that, we shouldn't offer it? No, I'm not going to be the guy because that's easily yep. spun as, well, Bogosian yep. hates Native that's Americans. That's right. No, it has nothing to do with me hating Native Americans. It, I, no, it's if you want to offer a course, that has to play by the same rules as every other class. I keep going back to the outcome. I keep going back to trying to find out what the outcome is. But, you know, if you don't mind, for some of the audience that doesn't know uh, uh, what you and your partner did with the hoax papers, do you mind sharing a, a couple of those stories on what you guys did with the hoax papers? Yeah, so let, let's, let's put a pin in the, the, the outcome. The outcome is to destroy the system to create a new utopia because it's not biology that's standing in the way. It's, all, it's, it's the patriarchy that's standing in the way in systemic racism. And if we can only destroy the system, we can create some kind of a utopia. History doesn't okay. favor those guys. History just no, doesn't favor. They've done yeah. quite a bit of damage Fantastic. to society. Fantastic. No, they've, they've done a great amount of damage to society. No question about it. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so the hoax papers. So we, I, I noticed that this stuff being in the belly of the beast, I noticed that this madness, I, I used to follow on Twitter uh, a, um, a uh, Twitter feed called New Real Peer Review, and they would tweet out the actual articles from peer reviewed. These are scholarly presentations. And I, I, I would think, like, these are just, can I swear on your show? Sure, go for it. Like, these are fucking insane. Like, yeah. These are just batshit crazy. And Alan Sokol, who subsequently became a friend of mine, published a fake paper in the late 90s. And that paper was in a postmodern journal. And he wanted to expose the, the kind of, quote, unquote, scholarship in the journal is just bogus. And so he used gibberish to do so. And he talked about meaningless things. So... I thought, well, let's let's do it, do a Sokol style hoax. So uh, my buddy and I wrote down, wrote a, a, a paper and, and you can link to it in the description here. The conceptual penis is a social construct. And we argued, <laughs> we argued, among other things in that paper, that, you know, penises were responsible for climate change and it was gibberish and it was <laughs> and, and, and they <laughs> it's a really funny paper, man. You should read it. It's really funny. Uh, uh, but I'll let I'll let you and your audience decide if it's funny or not. Um, and so um, people went crazy. They 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 lost their minds. And the point of this was to show that look, you know, these journals are publishing stuff. They're publishing, you know, if we said the same thing about vaginas, it never would have gotten in, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of people had some very legitimate criticisms of of the journal and. They said, you know, this paper does not do what you think it does. If if you want this paper, if, if you want to show that gender studies in particular, but anything with the word studies in it is just publishing dangerous nonsense, you have to do this with better journals. You have to do this with more journals. They gave us a roadmap, you know. And so I said to, to, to my buddy, okay, well, dude, let's just do this. They've told us exactly what we need to do. Let's do it. He said, all right. So uh, over the course of the year, the three of us wrote uh, 20 papers. The Wall Street Journal caught us, which ironically was because the paper about dog rape. We claim that uh, um, uh, dog parks are petri dishes for canine rape culture, and we need to leash men like we need leash dogs. And we looked at it from black feminist criminology. That paper won an award. Get out of here. No, I took totally serious. It won an award. But anyway, the, the Wall Street Journal busted us, and we for sure we would have gotten more than seven papers published. And these papers were just insane. They were just like, you know, fat bodybuilding, that fat people should go into professional bodybuilding spaces and display their fat in, in non-competitive ways so they should be given equal time. So we, we did a whole bunch full of... Full-on troll. I mean, this is a full-on troll job. Well, it's even well. The the point. I mean, we translated Hitler's Mein Kampf, and and uh, I mean, you know, we, we did about th remediating uh, transphobia by why. You know, why we asked the question. Why don't men like things uh, shoved up their asses? Uh, you said I could speak uh, a blunt <laughs> on your show, and we came up with this whole thing about you know they're transphobic. <laughs> But anyway, anyway, the, 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 the point the point of this is that we, we were trying to make the point that um, that there are bodies of literature producing nonsense. This shit is untethered to reality. They're teaching this in to the kids as knowledge. Um, and, and you want to know, frankly, what's responsible for this is that people think that they know things. Right. And they think they know things because it's in peer reviewed journals that people with PhDs teach them. No, these are the musings of ideologues. That's what that is. These are the moral impulses that people discharge in journal, journals and teach kids and then have the audacity to test them on it. That's why I told you that story about my mentor Frank, yeah. and having that thing. Because what happens is anything that doesn't fit the narrative is just removed from the curricula, right? So we have everybody thinking the same thing. Oh, you know, IQ is bogus. There, it's just, you know, we have everybody thinking the same thing about sexual orientation and race. And look, here's the, the, the rub to this. We need to study these issues. We need to. But we need to do that rigorously, and we need to do it honestly, and we need to we need to have, we need to try to falsify what these claims are, not to try to prove them. 
And if we want to make any steps forward as a society, if we want to build better institutions, if we want to treat people more kindly and more compassionately and more humanely, that has to be because, not because we just started making shit up, but because we tried our best, we forwarded hypotheses, and we used the tools of science to, to see if those hypotheses stood up to scrutiny. That's how we make a better society. So I got, a, I, I, I got a call the other day from a guy in Hollywood who says some of the guys from CNN and Fox are uh, wanting to leave and start a, a, a media company and they'd like to talk to you. Anyways, we're having a conversation together right now, follow up. They want the company to be 50% owned by people on the right, 50% owned by people on the left, right? That's what they want to do. And let's go and see, you know, how this is going to look when we run the company. So everything gets debated nonstop. How should these papers be judged where somebody from both sides can sit there and, you know, uh, 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 not just trash it, but be almost like the devil's advocate to, you know, show some, uh, 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 you know, leaks in the argument? And, and, and if we don't have that today, what is the current process of getting a paper published? Well, that's, that's what the re two things. One, that's what the reviewers are supposed to do. The reviewers are supposed to find flaws in the argument. Who are but the reviewers? Instead, the reviewers are literally experts in their field. People who have been deemed experts in their field review the papers. That's how the peer-reviewed process works. You have the, I don't know if they're world's leading scholars, but, but bona fide scholars who have published in scholarly journals read over your piece and then make recommendations. And in most cases, they made recommendations that made our papers more crazy. So we took those recommendations and we wrote them right into the paper. The second thing about the media enterprise is we are in desperate need of that. My my unsolicited advice to your friend is I would definitely not do it 50-50. The problem with that is that 50-50 will leave out other voices. There are many voices, like Andrew Yang wants to make the forward party. I'm actually speaking to him on Friday. But, um, you know, the, there, there are... You supported him. You supported him in 2016, I think, right? You were... That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. There are, you know, Greens and Libertarians, et cetera, there are many alternatives, uh, and my, my fear is that if you just had a 50-50 split, you'd just be replicating, in a sense, the same thing over and over. You know, the famous John, John Stewart when, uh, or, or when he went on Tucker Carlson. You know, you, you don't want to be that guy who replicates a kind of division. You, my thinking would be you want genuine intellectual diversity. You want to present the, the best arguments on both sides, but you want to do so in, in a certain way that um, that – that I, I just think it needs to be more thoughtful than 50 50 although I, I'm very sympathetic with that that um, that impulse yeah I think that, I think as long as we go in the direction where we can see opposing sides sincerely having a fair platform to argue each other and the audience makes a decision for themselves I think yeah. we win I you yeah, know and, like when and, you're saying 99 percent is one side one percent the other side who the hell is winning nobody's winning there right. And that's what we don't have right now, right? We, we don't, kids aren't seeing that. They're not seeing those conversations modeled for them. They're, they're not, uh, they, they feel uncomfortable asking questions. They don't even have anybody who, who, who disagrees with the other side. And if anybody is wondering about that, here's a litmus test question. You, if you know a gender studies student, ask them this. Do they know what Martha Nussbaum's criticism of Judith Butler is? I don't want it's too very inside baseball, but the idea is that they will not know it and they will not know it because they're not taught other sides of the issue. These are advocacy institutions. They're activist institutions that push certain points of view. So what's the long term solution? Let's wrap it up with that. What is the long term solution? What can the average guy do? And if not the average guy, somebody who is an influencer and is worried about coming out, what can he or she do uh, short term and long term? Okay, so a few things. The first order of business, I'm coming out with a, uh, a series of videos. I now have a Substack. My last name is Bogosian, B-O-G-H-O-S-I-N, Bogosian. Uh, I have a, um, I, I'm on Twitter, at Peter Bogosian. And so I, my goal is to give people a front row seat in the culture war to re-anchor us in reason and evidence and civility and argument and basically not being dicks to each other. And how do we do that? So the, what, one of the things that the average person can do as they move forward is they can listen. 
They need to figure out what people mean by certain words. If you don't have that, that's not academic. That's just having a conversation with someone. Like, what do you mean by equity? Again, most people have no idea what it means. Yeah. Minoritize, houseless. No, and people don't know, know what those words mean, and we hear them increasingly. Um, I would suggest that you that people who want to do something about this listen, learn. You can read the book Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose the, and James Lindsay. That's like a master level course in all of this stuff. It explains this in detail. I, um, the other thing you can do is you can document. You can go to meetings. You can record. Look at the whatever the laws of the state are. Um, but you know, take pictures of, of material, and then you can do what Jody Shaw did. You can just go to YouTube and and post those videos to YouTube because we need to let people know it's happening. The other thing, if you want to do, you can be more involved, and in, you can actually, you know, like I have projects I need help in, like you know, not financially involved, but you know, like we need a lawyer right now, and we need, you know, we just need people to help us. And there are other organizations. The Astronomani is doing wonderful work. So that you can get involved and get involved in a way that, that makes you feel comfortable. But the most important thing in all of this is you have to be forthright in your speech and you have to be honest when you talk to people. And you have to know that one of the consequences of you being forthright and honest in your speech is that you will lose quote unquote friends. But those people will never be your friends to begin with. If your friends aren't, if your friendships aren't based on virtue, they're just, they're, I wouldn't say they're bullshit, but they're not what you think they are. Now, the, the answer to your last question, what we can end on this, what do we do in terms of the context of the university system? We have to make truth the primary um, um, that goal and value of the institution. The moment the truth is no longer part of the institution, it becomes a kind of ideology factory. A, whatever the ideology is today it's wokeism who the hell knows what it's going to be tomorrow nobody knows what it's going to be but it has to be truth and it has to have intellectual diversity and <clears throat> for example if you're donating to your alma mater i would stop and basically every university because these aren't the same institutions that you went to there are new institutions emerging one great is in point <clears throat> yep one is in austin i'll be a part of that uh and there and those are based on genuine free speech open inquiry and people actually having conversations with each other. But truth is the goal. So as long as truth is the North Star, you're good to go. Well, brother, it's been great having you on. I really enjoyed listening to you. We're going to put the links to uh, your book below, the How to Have Impossible Conversations, as well as the paper you recommended. But I really enjoyed this, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Where do you live? Let's have a few drinks. Come on down, Fort Lauderdale. Come on down here in South Florida. We'll have a good time together. I'd love that. I to totally love that, man. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, bro. Take care, buddy. Honestly, I lost count how many topics we covered, but, but, but it was a lot of stuff that we went through. Curious to know what stuck with you. Do you agree with him? If you do, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you enjoyed this interview, two other interviews I think you'll enjoy. One is with Gatsot, which was not only uh, informative, it was entertaining. You're going to laugh. Or with anarchist Michael Malice, complete different angle. But it makes sense if you listen to him as well. So click if you want to watch us. If not, watch Gadsaw. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.